we have the radio on and we turn it on it will put that over there. Hello, Hello. What is this an electromagnetic what is this machine? Yep. Yeah. What is it? So um, John Riley is a friend and he invented this machine and it's supposed to be producing electromagnetic field or it does electromagnetic induction. So it's much stronger now, like that. Yeah. that. You can see the purple color. Yeah. But the granite's still almost nothing. Oh, yeah. which is amazing. Uncharted X, my name is Ben, and I've got an interesting video for you all today. This is something of a journey into the possible, into an illustration of understanding our perspective when it comes to ancient mysteries, and also hopefully a little bit of an example of the type of knowledge that we might be able to unlock if we were brave enough to take a fresh look at some of these enigmas, to re-examine them with an open mind and a perspective that is wide enough to acknowledge that some of the answers to these mysteries may well lie outside of our understanding, and that perhaps not everything we see from the past is simply the result of nothing more than hard-working, primitive ancient civilizations who only ever built tombs or temples or symbolic ritual and religious structures. We make this assumption because we generally believe that today we stand on the pinnacle of knowledge and human progress, and that every single civilization that has come before us was simply not capable of building for any other purpose than symbolic, and certainly not capable of building for function or for industry or in order to use types of technology that perhaps are unknown to us. I think that some of these clues come to us from the distant past, and I want to give you a couple of thought-provoking examples to illustrate this, and to share a little experiment that we did with my friend Yusuf Awan, who is an expert guide, a stonemason, a chemitologist, and somebody who has been studying ancient mysteries his whole life with an open mind to all possibilities. The experiment you're about to see occurred when I was in Egypt in 2016 with my friend Luke, and the other voice you'll hear apart from Yusuf's is his brother, Harun. I'll let this experiment play out and then I'll be back to talk about some of the details and to show how this relates to both megalithic sites and to our perspective when we are looking at them. So, um, John Riley is a friend and he invented this machine and it's supposed to be producing electromagnetic field or it does electromagnetic induction. So, um, we believe or like it's a possibility that the site is um, dealing with electromagnetic energy in one way or in more than one way. Anyway, we wanted to test the, the different types of stones, the effect of this device on the different types of stones. So we brought uh, this piece, Harun card, to look like a three-dimensional jet pillar. Yeah. And, uh, we brought some of the types of stones that uh, we see usually in the site, which is of course the limestone, yeah. and the basalt stone, and the granite stone. In the combination, we're going to see the demonstration, and we will see uh, that the limestone is the most powerful stone that uh, inducts that kind of current. Shagra. Hot al jiri. Give it some time to charge.
So of course, electricity alone wouldn't be uh, inducted through stone, but electromagnetic is. And what's the rod made of? Is it just copper? Basalt. No, no, this, this one is, is aluminium. Aluminium. Yeah. aluminium. Yeah. And this is basalt. Yes, basalt. Okay. Not as strong as uh, mm. as granite. As limestone. <coughs> I mean as limestone. Is there possible an explanation for why we, they use so many different types of stones to create the architecture? And In my like opinion, there is no doubt that the, the combination of the stones was specifically chosen to accomplish something. You know, you, nobody just goes to different quarries. No hundreds of kilometers far just to, to build something or for something symbolic because colors uh, and things like that and drawings can obviously there was a, there was a reason they were encasing all that limestone in and, and the two different types of limestone as well so this is this is closer to the finer type of limestone So it's much stronger now, like that. Yeah. that you can see the purple color. Yeah. But the granite is still almost nothing. Oh, yeah. which is amazing. I, in the beginning, I thought granite would induct it more, but alabaster is not conductive. Yeah, it's uh, also marble is not conductive. Yeah. Interesting. That you is find the limestone, especially limestone. He had the gold plated. Uh, a piece yeah. and uh, the induction in the gold plated piece was uh, as close or like the same as limestone. Hmm? I love the that same you, strength. You've made this like a like a jet there. Yeah. Well, it's it's almost like the basalt when conducting because it's coming through the limestone in it's out the basalt. It's almost like a stronger reaction for some reason. I don't for know why. But happened. the granite the granite didn't do yeah. anything. Where before yeah. it. Had, this was, it, when you put this flat on this, this mm. made a, a noise, but when it was on the jetstone isolated, it could do nothing, right? Like you get the basalt in the foundation. Yeah. I always asked why wouldn't they just use smaller blocks or smaller pieces of granite to do the floor right. as well. Hmm? So. There is, there is still no conclusion to this because we, we actually don't know what we are researching for. Yeah, right. But of course, um, um, geophysicists would understand uh, more about why this combination of stones is, is chosen, what kind of goals it can achieve or accomplish. Yeah. Yeah. There is no doubt, you can see many different types of stones in the pyramid structure, limestone, basalt stone, quartzite, white calcite, and uh, two different types of limestones, but because we see the, the limestone is in the core of the granite walls. If you realized this <laughs> in the... <laughs> you sure? It's gonna blow! Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm gonna you yeah. <sighs> I feel it. <laughs> Oh my God! Yeah, that's a yeah. that's a serious <laughs> shock, though, really. It's it's oh, yeah, heating actually. Thank you, it's heating. Take more. Take sure. That's gonna make it stronger for sure. I will. Sure. I think. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. I think the rubber is helping. He's closer to us. <laughs> that's too funny. All right. Okay. Why am I holding this? Yeah, I'm holding this. Please tell me. We're gonna we're gonna hear the sound of the and the speak. Are you what? <laughs> yeah, if you touch it directly to the skin, it hurts. Yeah, it's like a little tingle in the finger. Yeah, yeah definitely. <laughs> That's hilarious. 
Wow. Pretty interesting, right? I'm betting that you have some questions. I certainly had them when I first saw this, so let me try to clear up a couple of those before we get into it. Firstly, the machine. It's called a Lifestream Field Generator Model 100, and it certainly does appear to be invented and sold by a John Riley. It's the smallest model in a range of products that do the same thing that this one does, which seems to be more or less producing a very high potential, high voltage, low current electromagnetic induction field. This model's byline claims 500,000 volts of radiant pulsed energy, which really isn't a term that means much at all to me. Trying to track down specifics on this device will lead you down something of an internet rabbit hole into the claimed healing powers of crystals, mystical massages, and all sorts of strange pseudoscientific videos. As with all of my work, I try to stick to the scientific method as much as I can and to things that have solid evidence or at least solid theory behind them. My background is in engineering and science, so I'll try to demystify this just a little bit. First of all, electromagnetic induction is just electricity. It's what our economy runs on, and the principle was at the root of the technological and industrial revolution of the past couple hundred years. The same revolution that resulted in our crazy, complex, connected, electrified, and digitized way of life that we currently enjoy. Electrons and changing magnetic fields. It's how we produce electrical power, and many, many devices run based on this principle. If you want to understand the physics and the principles behind this and things like Faraday's law, I'd recommend this lecture and demonstration of electromagnetic induction. A link to the lecture is below in the video description and the topic starts about five minutes in. So otherwise, there's only a little bit of discussion on this particular device that I've been able to find and in particular some on a skeptic website. Interestingly, one of these devices was used in an episode of Joe Rogan's short-lived show, Joe Rogan Questions Everything. This was used in an experiment that was supposed to show how HARP could alter the weather, and as far as I can tell, the results were very much indeterminate. Again, links to those websites and articles are below for those who wish to follow up. I do want to say that there does seem to be some physiotherapy applications for this type of technology in the treatment of osteoarthritis and other conditions. I'm really not trying to discredit anything here or to challenge anyone's experience with such devices. I'm just trying to understand what exactly is going on. This experiment that we did in Giza and the device itself kind of reminds me of fun things I've seen done with a Van de Graaff generator. In any case, what is interesting to me is the different behavior of the different types of stone. And these are types of stone that are commonly used in many megalithic structures, particularly those in Egypt. But we do find basalt, limestone, and granite megalithic works in many other locations around the world. When I see different materials show different behavior like this, my mind really goes towards the science of semiconductors and logical circuitry, which at its core works purely on the difference in behavior under current of two types of transistors, known as N-type and P-type transistors. Combined in the millions and millions, these tiny nanometer-sized semiconductors allow us to create incredibly complex and efficient logical circuits, otherwise known as chips or CPUs or integrated circuits. Clearly, the relationship between this and megalithic stone is speculative, and I'm not claiming anything here other than the fact that this is a very interesting experiment, and it seems to be worthy of some further study. And I can't help but wonder if these clearly different high-voltage conductive properties of the different types of stone was a consideration in how these types of stones were chosen for their sites and how they were arranged. Before I get into how this experiment relates specifically to megalithic sites, I wanted to say something about perspective. Our perspective, how we view the world, how we interpret form and function, is very much a product of our knowledge base. But it's also a product of the current time that we're in, and to some extent the location. Perspectives most definitely change over time and location, and they certainly change with our knowledge base. Yet most of the time it just feels like our understanding of the world is just simply normal and unchanging. Think of things like traffic lights. Our common perspective informs us what they're for and how they're used. But if you brought somebody from 1,000 years ago into a modern city today, they'd be utterly bewildered and not just by the traffic lights. I try to constantly be aware of perspective and how it can limit our thinking. And I have a good example of how our perspective on fundamental things can and will change. And I'll try to cover that example briefly. I talk a lot more about perspective and the following example in much more detail in my very first podcast. It's a video that doesn't have a lot of views. I did it back when the channel only had a handful of subscribers. So if any of this is of interest, I'd really recommend giving it a listen. Most people know who Nikola Tesla was. 
One of his most famous experiments, which was more than 50 years ago now, was to do with distributing electricity in a wireless fashion. And he had a tower built at a place called Wardenclyffe that supposedly did just that. Now note that wirelessly does not necessarily mean over the air, it, it just means without wires. So today, there's a company that exists in Texas that appears to have figured this technology out. The company is called Visiv Technologies, and they have built what appears to be something that's very similar to Tesla's tower, and they call it their global test site. And they're claiming that they can use it to deliver electricity or signal to anywhere on the planet without wires or infrastructure. Just consider the possibilities for a minute. Imagine if this technology was all of a sudden adopted on a wide scale. Imagine how it might change our perspective on a fundamental thing like electricity. This isn't science fiction, it's just science, and nowadays it's actually application. It turns out that there's more than one theory of electromagnetic wave propagation. Almost everything electric in our world at this point has always worked on something called Hertzian wave theory. You might recognize the term Hertz. This theory relies on wires to send both power and signals uh, on shielded wires or to broadcast radio and signals into the air using unshielded wires, otherwise known as antennas. There is another theory of electromagnetic wave propagation though, and it's one that has only fairly recently been proven as viable. And this theory also seems to be that which Tesla's tower was based on. Although really nobody outside of the government knows because everything Tesla did was pretty much classified by the FBI and the military and has remained so. This other theory is known as Xenic surface wave theory, and essentially we can use it to send power or signal, which is essentially the same thing, to anywhere on the surface of the planet without wires or requiring line of sight. We can send this power and signals without much in the way of loss, without the danger of shock or radiation, and without disruption, because there's no grid as such that a storm or a natural disaster could destroy. Xenic surface waves don't give off any radiation, unlike Hertzian wave theory, which you can pretty much just sense if you ever go near any really high voltage power lines. Xenic surface wave theory basically uses the interface between the surface and the air. Think of a balloon that is inflated around the entire planet, and there's your potential field application for this technology. And as I said, this isn't really just theory any longer. It's been worked out. Visive Technology is marketing this into several sectors of the power industry, from what I can tell. And, at least to me, it's an utterly revolutionary development for our infrastructure globally. Now there is lots of information available both about Xenic surface waves and Visiv Technologies particular application available on their website. But the idea is that you could simply put one of these towers up somewhere near your power source. Maybe it's a nuclear power plant that's been set up in a geologically stable area, maybe away from coastlines in tsunami areas as a good start. Or it might be a solar plant that's been put up in the middle of a desert. And you don't need that to be near a city or anything like that. You can send that power now anywhere in the world. Just plug a receiver into the ground and boom, power up your microgrid and away you go. We no longer need satellites for global communication. Line of sight is no longer relevant. So just consider for a minute how this new discovery, this new technology, fundamentally changes our perspective on things like electricity, on signals, on current, or on communications. All of a sudden now, instead of wires and composite materials, now we're using natural materials. We're using the very earth itself as a medium. If you extend this analogy, you just realize that all we're doing here is just peeling back layers of our own ignorance as it relates to the fundamental nature of reality. If you had talked about this idea before Xenic surface waves had proven out, this would be considered complete science fiction. The idea itself was completely outside of our perspective. It's been outside of our knowledge base. Yet now our understanding and our perspective has changed with this new knowledge. That's exactly the type of thinking that I think we need when it comes to truly understanding some of the mysteries that come to us from our own past. And it's why I find little experiments like this one that we did in Egypt to be just so interesting. It's the possibilities of this that intrigue me. And again, I'm not claiming anything here with our little zappy megalithic experience. I just think that things like this need much more scientific investigation. I really just want people that are much smarter than me to look into this, but to look into it with open minds to any of the possibilities. Before I go back to the interview, let's look at a couple of examples of combinations of megalithic stones found on megalithic sites, particularly in Egypt. As Yusuf mentioned, we see combinations of megalithic stone on lots of sites, and this isn't an accidental thing, as the quarries for these different types of stones are typically in different locations, and quite often require the builders to transport large blocks over great distances. 
One of my favorite examples of this is Abu Sir, a site that I promise I will take a close look at in a future video. As you've seen from the clip already, there is plenty of basalt, limestone, and granite laying around at Abu Sir. I just want to point out a couple of other little things and let Yusuf do the talking in the interview. But what you're looking at here is rows of basalt that is essentially casing some limestone. The limestone in this case is on the right hand side. And what's interesting is that there is some weird effect that's happened to parts of the basalt and in particular the bits of the basalt that have been facing or right next to the limestone. The basalt starting to get all crumbly and actually peel away in some sections as you can see. You can also see the crumbling effect on this block here. The other example that we talk about is the Valley Temple, which is the just gargantuan structure that sits in front of the Sphinx and is connected to the second pyramid via the causeway. Now this is definitely another site that I want to talk about in more depth and detail in another video, but the thing to notice here is that the huge central core masonry of this so-called temple is made of limestone. And you can see in front of these limestone blocks, it's actually been cased in granite. There's lots of anomalies when it comes to how this was cased or when it was cased, and in particular the erosion that is showing on these limestone blocks. So, is it a coincidence that the walls, for example, for in the Valley Temple, you realize that the, the granite wall, a very wide uh, wall, and the, the core of it is limestone. Seems like the basalt in, uh, in Abu Sir also under the granite the wall in the pyramid structure, the core of it is limestone and then cased with granite on both sides. Yeah, I mean, and the, and the limestone inside is all, it's all eroded. Yeah, it, it, eroded. It, it looks and like coal. Here we have, it's been here we have uh, uh, some, uh, um, like many opinions in that point especially, because uh, for example, Dr. Robert Chuck believes this is that these walls are much older then the granite walls, and when the granite walls, when the limestone White walls marble. started to deteriorate, then they renovated it with granite, and still both pre-dynastic, or pre-cataclysm. Nice. That's why marble is not in the combination of a pyramid structure. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. Right. There's definitely something going so, on. So, I have a different opinion about uh, what uh, Dr. Robert Chuck uh, believes. And I, of course, I respect his knowledge. He's much more knowledgeable than me in geology. But um, as a stone carver, I see that the, um, the limestone blocks are shaped in a three-dimensional way to have the granite stone interlocking with it. That means when I'm building this, I'm already putting in my mind that this is going to come and interlock with it. So the proof here is that if the stone, one of the other opinions that the stone is eroded and then, or built with it as, and when it was eroded, or that it got eroded, then they renovated the site with the granite, and as another layer. But we can find the same erosion in the parts that was carved to interlock the granite, which means that erosion is after machine. And I, we were talking about this, yeah. the transformation in the stone. Before, naturally, mi millions of thing, wonders you can see in the stone naturally. But after machining, then there is something else. It can be how long time does it take to deteriorate, or was there, and of course this is imagination, there is no real, real uh, like, relevant facts uh, to this. There are, actually, but not like as strong as we can believe in it. But I can imagine it. If it had, if the limestone inducted currents of energies like that, would it cause it to deteriorate and look older? Would it affect the molecular structure of it? Of the, like the basalt that's, that's, that's touching it as well? Like, like the basalt? Yeah. Exactly, exactly. The machine surface? So there is, exactly. Yeah. So there is no doubt that what we saw in the, the basalt today, that it crumbles like that, it can happen naturally in basalt. Yeah. But when you find it on a surface that look like it was machine, the sharpness of it, of okay. course, and then the effect happened, or afterwards. that afterwards. Yeah. Then There's also mixed. plenty of basalt there that's been facing the sun for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, and it's in perfect, perfect yeah, condition. Yeah, I don't think it's the sun has this kind of effect the on the basalt. It's against the yeah. has this. Yeah, the basalt stone is a plutonic stone, so it's, it's, it's formed in the magma of the volcano. Mm -hmm. 
the sun light or the sun heat, uh, unless it's a plasma event, it's right. not gonna. Mm? And the plus that crumbling uh, basalt, it is it's in the inner core, or it's the in the core, in the inside part of the wall. We right. were just saying that two layers, yeah. one layer of limestone and the two layers of granite or basalt. So that crumbling part is the one in the inside also. It was not facing the, it the was facing withering. The, it was facing the limestone. It was facing the limestone. Well, that was a little bit of fun. I uh, certainly never said that I wasn't going to do any wild speculation on my channel, uh, so there's a little bit of it for you. I'm actually just trying to start a discussion on this stuff. I would love it if somebody that was uh, smarter than me could tell me exactly what's going on here. I'd really just like to get to the bottom of it. I was a little confused with that, as was Yusuf, given that the granite seems to act like an isolator instead of a conductor. I would have thought it would have been the other way around, given that it does have a high crystalline content and it can carry a charge with piezoelectricity, but maybe it needs to be under pressure or something like that. I don't know. Just a couple of quick things. I want to thank everybody who's reached out to me after the last video, my uh, Puma Punku Tiwanaku video. The response to that was really good, and I I'm glad you guys liked that. I'm definitely working on more episodes for that. I was also going to say that anybody who does actually contribute to me or donate to me uh, $20 or more, send me your uh, postal address and I will send you a few of these, these little Uncharted X uh, die cut stickers. If you want them, just uh, include your address in any donation notes and I will definitely send them to you. I've got a back catalog of plenty of people I'm trying to get to, so if you have donated to me uh, in the past 20 bucks or more, please feel free to send me your uh, address and I will get some stickers out to you. Just a little something that I'm trying to give back to people for helping to support me. And on that note, I'd recommend not buying the stickers that are available in the merch store on Teespring. I've found those to be little tiny things and they're just not worth the money that they want for them, which is like seven bucks or something. I'm not making any money on those. I'm just, they're just one of the items on my, uh, on my list. Otherwise, this will be the only video that I upload this week. I'm literally uploading this as the last thing I do before I go off to take a few days backpacking in the Grand Canyon, which I am just really looking forward to. I haven't had a chance to step away or do anything uh, this year at all, other than my daily routine and trying to get this channel growing as well as getting my farm organized, <laughs> growing a lot of food. But uh, I will be back next week and hoping to keep publishing and I will see all the comments and respond to people probably next week. Otherwise, please consider giving the video a thumbs up and subscribing to the channel. And also, please do consider supporting Uncharted X. You can do that via the value for value model. All of the details on how to do that are outlined at unchartedx.com support. So I will see you all in the next video. Peace.